Um, Alan is, has been a member for, I don't know, forever. And uh, um, we're really, uh, as a professional wood turner, and we're really pleased to have him here uh, to uh, demonstrate how he makes a three-legged stool. So just give us one second to switch mics here and get set up, and we will start. Showing how I do my 24-inch tall three-legged stool. I'll be turning the seat and one leg just to go over the spindle work and uh, faceplate work. And then I'll kind of, we'll run a video on how I drill the holes in the seats because I have a special attachment on my drill press. And uh, so I'll go ahead and get started. The first thing I do is I always do the seat first. It's because I want to fit my tenons on my legs to the hole in the seat. Uh, sometimes I turn my seats in advance or a couple of days ahead of time. And when the humidity changes, the, the hole becomes oval. And so the tenon might not fit if I just do them all to one inch. I drill a one inch hole in the seat. So I like to drill up, do the seat first and then I fit the legs to the seat. And usually I do uh, three or three to five stools at a time. The first thing I have to do is I get my blank. And I like to use a highly figured piece of wood. And I like to have a contrasting leg. So if I'm using maple, I'll have walnut or uh, in this case, paduke legs, or I'll dye the legs, but I want contrasting colors. Cherry works nice with ambrosia maple. And so I grab my blank and I'll, what I usually do is I try to figure out which side has the most figure. And that's gonna end up being where the seat is. And so I'll run the side, it's gonna be the back through my planer. You get a nice even, even face. If it's highly figured uh, maple, I might run it through my drum sander, but I get this face already flat and sanded and polished. And then I don't touch it again until after I drill the holes and I sand out all the, all the guidelines. So I've already cut this out of the blank. I've already found the centers and I've already drilled the hole. And I'm assuming I have this tape on here because this was the prettiest board in the class I taught. And I wanted for myself, not for my students because I give them too nice of wood. So I use a one-way screw, no matter what chuck you have, if you got a Nova chuck or a Vicmar chuck, you want to get the one-way screw. And the reason for that is the one-way screw, the threads are cut right, so they hold. The Nova screws are cut right, are not cut right. They don't hold very well. And the Vicmark screw is perfectly round here. So what happens is it spins in your chuck. But the one-way screw has these little dimples. I don't know if the camera's gonna pick them up. There's a little dimple right there. And there's little pins that come out in the jaws that go into those dimples and they lock on that screw. So the one-way screws have good threads, good locking mechanism. So I highly recommend spending the 26 or $28 and getting the one-way screw no matter what chuck you have. And you line the dimple up with the tip of the jaws. Yes, they still come. If you buy a one-way chuck, a talon chuck or a one-way or stronghold, they come with it. So if you buy a Nova or Vic Mark, you want to go ahead and get the one-way screw. And I make sure it's good and tight. Uh, last time I taught a stool class, some of them weren't completely tight and they got a little loose. And because I have a two inch thick blank, I don't want to have that hole show up in the seat because I'm going to dish down the part we sit in. So I, I use a little spacer block. So I just use a little piece of uh, MDF or you know quarter inch plywood as a spacer. Uh, I drill a five eighths inch hole so it goes over the screw nice and easily. And then I take my chamfer bit. This is a chamfer bit. It's only got one cutter, but it'll kind of open up the hole a little bit. So I chamfer, I chamfer my spacer. And then after I drill my hole in my blank, I'll chamfer it because when you run the screw into dry wood, the fibers are gonna come up. And if they're sitting on that flat plate, it'll push it off the flat plate and you'll get a little bit of vibration. So if you have those chamfers there, it gives those fibers somewhere to go. So what I do to figure out how deep to do the hole, 
And so I put the plate on there and then I set my veneer calipers and I usually go maybe uh, three sixteenths to a quarter deeper than necessary. And then I take my drill bit with a one-way screw. It recommends a three eighths inch uh, hole. And that's really best for green wood. If you're turning wet wood, three eighths hole works. If you're turning this kiln dried stuff and you're doing hard maple, you won't be able to screw it on on a three eighths inch hole. So I do a 13 30 seconds in kiln dried, kiln dried wood. And then I take my calipers and I go in the wings of the drill bit. And then that's where I put my tape. And I use tape instead of the stop on my drill press because I don't try to get these all the same thickness. And I had a friend of mine, guy in the club helped me one time and he took the tape off and set the stop on the drill press. And then when the guys went to put them on their chucks, some of them wouldn't fit because they were in fatter blanks, skinnier blanks than the other ones. So the hole wasn't deep enough. And I said, oh, you shouldn't have taken the tape off because this works no matter how thick it is. So I've already drilled the hole, so we don't need to see that. So hopefully I grabbed the right chuck. I've got a one-way lathe at home. And it helps if you don't get it on there crooked. It doesn't want to go on if it's crooked. And I like to turn it by hand because if you spin this thing home and you have two perfectly flat pieces of steel and you spin it on there real hard and it slaps together, you may not get it off. So I just figured I'd warn you. I've got it on there hand tight. And normally with the one-way screws, there's a little set screw you can lock it on in case you want to reverse turn, but apparently mine are gone. I don't use this chuck much, but it's got the uh, number five jaws on it. So it'll be more stable, less vibration out on those corners. Oh, and this is one of the old Powermatics. As long as I keep pressure on this, it'll stay locked. And then you want to get it tight, but if you're a real muscle, muscle guy, don't get it super tight because you don't want to strip it out. Yeah, that's good enough. And I should have, while I was waiting, should have checked to make sure I was on the right pulley. And you're gonna, oh, I am on the right pulley. That's a slow speed. Big pulley up top, slow speed. That's where I want to be. thinking backwards. Now, normally if I was doing a bowl or a platter, I would just go ahead, this is the back side. Well, this is the top of my stool, but I'd go ahead and knock the corner off because going straight across and turning this to a round shape, you're hitting that end grain straight on and that's the hardest cut there is. But because I'm doing a stool seat and I wanna know where that outside edge is, I'm just gonna go straight across and, and fight, the, fight the grain and generally you want the tool rest at a height so that your tool, when it's horizontal, hits dead center. And one of the easiest ways to do that, turn that dial down. It's been a while since I've used a Powermatic. Make sure we're in forward and not reverse. It's always fun when you're in reverse and don't know it. Well, I'm trying to make a mark in there. So when the tool's horizontal, tool rest is a hair high. So I'm gonna drop it a little bit. And on this back side, I'm kind of in the dark. And most importantly, I wanna wear a face shield. Oops, somebody smaller than me wore this. Here we go. Now with a face shield on, if you can't hear me, let me know. The guys on the Zoom thing are going to hear a wah, wah, wah from the echo from the face shield. Pretty much, I've got the tool rest parallel to the bed of the lathe, and I'm going to have the bevel parallel to the bed of the lathe, and I'm going to have that flute at about 10 o'clock or 45 degrees. What I'm going to do first is I'm going to bump that heel into the blank because this is not round at all. So I'll find out where that high spot is, and then I'll come to the outside, open it up to that. 10 o'clock and then I'll just take a light cut. And technically speaking, you need to cut in from the outside and in from the outside, 
but because I'm going to round these corners off anyway, I don't care if there's a little bit of tear out on those corners. So I'm just going to go straight across. And rule of thumb for speed is you take the uh, diameter times the RPMs, that should fall between six and 9,000. So this is uh, 12 inches. So, and the other rule of thumb is when the lathe starts rocking, it's don't go any faster till you get it balanced. It's not rocking too much. And I'm going, well, I'm only going 300. Sometimes you can get up past it. So right now I'm at 500 RPMs. I'm thinking six would probably be better. Sounds, sounds all right. So I'm gonna bump the heel. There's the surface. And I'm just, the only pressure I have is down on the tool rest. This is the point where I wish the guy who, who cut this on the bandsaw had, had taken his time and cut it closer to a circle. I threatened to fire him every now and then, but he doesn't seem to understand. He keeps showing back up. Now that I've got a little bit more balance, I can get a little bit more speed. Well, I feel a little bit of vibration, so I know I'm not at a circle yet. That feels better. This lays in pretty good shape. So I've got some tear out because I wasn't being real careful. I still have one little flat in there. So I'm going to go ahead and start shaping it. So I'm going to kind of just round over the back edge a little bit. I think I can squeeze in here. And I'm going to kind of cross my hands over. I think I can do it. And this cut, this cut's a little difficult because I'm riding the bevel straight up and down, and it's real easy to get on the wrong side of the of the flute. Generally, you want to be cutting at the very tip or the side of the flute in the direction you're going. But the nice thing is, is my left my left thumb is pushing it across the surface, so I don't have to worry about much pressure on the bevel because I'm pushing it across the surface. So what my thumb is doing is just pushing down onto the tool rest and across that surface. And my right hand is steering the tool because the bevel points in direction of cut. In order to do that, the tool handle has to point in direction of cut. My right hand is just swinging it around and my body is swinging with it. And because I do a lot of spindle work, I'm used to moving my hips parallel to the cut I'm doing. So I automatically just start moving with the, with the tool. And a lot of times what I'll do is I'll put a little center line on the stool seat before I round it off. So I have some idea of symmetry, but I forgot to do that. So we'll just guess at symmetry. Doesn't have to be perfect. Now I'm gonna go ahead and roll it over the other way. I'd like to make it hard for the cameraman. He's trying to do a good job. So once again, I'm gonna to touch the heel. The bevel's gonna be basically parallel to the tool rest. I'm gonna to touch the heel to find out where that surface is. And I'm going to slide off, put it in a cutting position. And I'm just going to get the wood that's in the way out of the way. Just like rolling a bead.
a lot of the students I get, they want to, all they want to do is turn bowls. They don't want to spend any time turning spindles or working on the bead and toe stick. And the outside of a bowl is a bead. Inside of a bowl is a cove. If you get good at beads and coves, then it's real easy to do the inside and outside of a bowl. And Jimmy Clue says it best because he's a nice guy and I'm not. But he says a good spindle turner can tur turn anything, but a good bowl turner can turn good bowls. So put your time in and understand how the tool works. I'm cutting at the very tip where it looks like that bottom wing of the flute is doing the cutting. But you don't want that upper wing to get in the cut. Otherwise, it'll be a catch. It'll pull back on you. It'll be an unsupported cut. And the speed I'm going across this surface is a direct relationship to how fast the lathe is spinning. That's looking pretty good for right now. So now I'm gonna kind of dish it out. I like to kind of make it kind of like a, a red blood cell or one of those lifesavers where it's a little, little uh, indented in the middle. Somewhere between a half an inch and three eighths of an inch is good. That way it fits your cheeks better. And with these robust tool rests, you gotta pay attention to where the top of the banjo is. I wanna get this rest closer, but if I do, a banjo is gonna be hitting. And it's one of those things you don't notice until you turn the lathe on and you wonder what all that noise is. And you're going, well, the Taurus isn't hitting there. You see the top of the banjos. I don't know if that's ever happened to any of y'all, but it's happened to me. <laughs> it's happened to me a few times, especially my one way, because the one way has got an even bigger gap between there. But luckily I remembered. And it's always, oh yeah, what I forgot to do, I started to is take my watch off. This is a dangerous weapon when you're turning, especially with a chuck. So when I'm going across, I'm going to do a facing, facing off gut. Even if I'd run both sides through the planer, it's still not going to be even depending on how it got screwed on there and a bunch of other stuff. So I want to have a nice flat surface before I start hogging it out. And so I'm just going to once again, touch the heel, open up the flute. I'm going to take a light cut at first. And I'm going to make sure I get my hand behind the tool rest. I'm going to have all body parts on my side of the tool rest. And the job of my left hand is to put pressure down on the tool rest and to put force parallel to the cut because my right hand is putting force this way and I don't want any pressure on the bevel. I want to just glide across that surface. If I have pressure on the bevel, it makes a lot of noise, a lot of extra work on my part. A whole lot easier just to slide across that surface. And sometimes if I get too heavy of a cut, I'll just break it in half. But I really don't, I don't like using force. I don't like hogging wood out. I like every cut to be nice cut. Partly because I'm putting pressure on the bevel, but partly because there's some really nice curly grain in here. Some really nice curl right in there. So it's, it's a little harder than the rest of it. So I'm gonna to try to keep pressure off the bevel. And then we also have the problem the humidity in here is different than where it was at my sock. This guy's going to be changing shape on me.
and I slow up when I get near the middle, especially when I get near that little uh, pimple right in there, because I don't want to break through and go to the other side. And also there's no support for that little last bit of fiber. And I don't want to tear it out. I'm going to check to see uh, how much I dished it out. So I'm about a quarter of an inch, a heavy quarter of an inch. So I'll dish it out a little bit more. I brought a ruler with me, but that, that uh, story stick works pretty good. So I'll do one more pass in here. And the speed I go across this surface is in direct relationship to how fast the wave is going. Wow. That's really weird. No, it's that, it's that curly grain. I, I swear I got it tight. Yeah, it's tight. Well, there's a couple of knots right in there. Yeah, there's some really hard surface right in there. That's probably what's doing it. Or maybe I'm just out of practice and putting too much pressure on the bevel. I'd like to think I don't have pressure on the bevel, but. But usually what happens down here in the middle, she either will end up with a bump or a dip. It's really hard to get perfectly flat. Oh, and by the way, I was using my side ground gouge with a slight convex curve on it. And I've got it peeled back probably about an inch. And I've grounded it uh, 50 degrees. Uh, most people call that a fingernail grind, but the fingernail refers to the shape of the tip, which is shaped like a fingernail. This is the side grind, the David Ellsworth grind, the Celtic grind, the Irish grind, blah, blah, blah. But it's fingernail is the shape of the tip. But I'm going to finish this off with my traditionally ground gouge. This is ground basically the same way you would ground a spindle roughing gouge. Uh, I've done a series of uh, reliefs on the back. Uh, Chris Ramsey will actually grinds it convex back there and then puts a small bevel on the top. I just go ahead and grind two or three bevels on the back just to get metal out of the way so it, I can take a tighter corner. And yeah, I was putting uh, pressure on the bevel. I can see a little swirly mark in there. Out of practice. So I'm gonna, this is a finishing cut. So I'm gonna to try to take a cut now as the thickness of the hair. And obviously I'm not doing a really good job today. So we'll see what happens. Well, obviously it's not the thickness of the hair. I lied once again. That's what I was supposed to do. And I'm running into that. There's like a little swirl, like a little chatter mark on there from the bevel. Putting pressure on it, still getting it. Well, nobody's perfect, especially me, so you won't worry about it. Now I'm gonna blend this edge up here to the curve. Put my body in the way of the camera so just get a good view of my back. As I come around this corner, I have to start rolling the flute closed. It started open at about 10 o'clock. When I get on this outside edge, Beginning to roll towards three o'clock. 
And that's the spirit far as I want to go. I think it's pretty funny that I chose this wood because it was ambrosia maple, soft maple, assuming it wouldn't give me a hard time. But it has that nice curl in there that's really just. Yeah. That's why they invented sandpaper. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna blend the two sides together and then I'll just show you what I would do sanding. I will not sand. Although everybody's wearing a dust mask, so it wouldn't matter. I would use this guy, my traditional ground gouge to finish this curve. I didn't bring a curve around far enough, so I had to change the angle of the tool rest. Didn't want to push my luck. Once again, I'm steering with my right hand. Now I'm going to come the other way. And one of the comments, one of the pros mentioned at the symposium was that because they're production workers, they don't turn the lathe off when they move the tool rest for production reasons. And they've done it enough where they don't have to worry about bumping into their work and ruining it. But I still like to, I still like to uh, try to remember to turn the lathe off when I move it. I made the mistake moving it one time and my finger got pinched. And I melted the, melted the back of my finger. I thought it was gonna be bleeding like crazy but I cauterized it. So I don't have any feeling on the back of that finger anymore. So I don't care about saving time. Just charge more for my work. Now I'm not gonna sand, but this is pretty much, I probably, oh, okay, I fixed that torn out drain. I had some tear out in here before, but it's gone now. And I got a valley right in here. I would go back and get rid of that valley because I'll never sand that out. But as long as I have ridges, I'd sand it. And what I would do is I would start out with one of these sanding sponges. And I'd start out with whatever grit looks like I need to get rid of the damage. And looking at that swirly pattern, and I got a little, couple of little ridges right in here. I could sit and fight with it and end up with my stool seat really dished out. Or I could just start with 80 grit sandpaper. Right now I only have 120, but I would put it on this sanding pad and put it there like that. And because this is hard, it'll take out all the high spots. Yeah, question. Uh, to back up just a moment, uh, somebody asked why you use a uh, traditional bond. When you get a get a more of a finished, uh, the reason I use a traditional ground gouge is you get. Uh, a, a cleaner cut, a better finish with that tool than with the uh, uh, side ground gouge or the fingernail grind. And a lot easier to sharpen. Yeah, it's a lot easier to sharpen too. Yeah, but mainly I get a I get a finer cut with it. Although this time I didn't really, but normally you get one of these things that's half the size of this little curl right here. But I'll go ahead and start with eighty grit with this guy, and then and then I would use a Scotch Brite pad as a backup to sand around here, but I wouldn't need 80 grit here. I would just use 80 grit up here. And I would use whatever grit, like on this, this, this part right here, I could probably start with 120 or 100. But in here where I have those swirly marks from all that curly grain in there, I would start with the 80. And then I would sand with the grain. Then I would go to the 100, sand with the grain. And then I'll go all the way up, and then maybe at 320, I'd sand with the grain again. So the lathe is an old design. Yeah, the lathe. Well, when I sand with the grain, I turn it off. Most of my sanding will be spinning, and then I'll turn it off and sand with the grain, get rid of those round scratches. The last thing I want to see when I put finish on here 
there's a little 80 grit scratch. And if you get that paper from Klingspore out of the bins, make sure you blow it off because the 80 grit's going to be in the bin with the 320 and the 320 is going to pick up 80 grit and you're going to sand with the 320 and you get one of those little scratches in there. So if you get that, get that stuff by the pound, make sure you blow it off before you use it. And I go all the way up to about 400 grit and then I'll, 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 I'll use my scotch right pad. I'll use the red one. Then I'll use the gray one. And then I'll use the tan one or the diamond one or the white one. Either one of these would be my finishing one. With this gold stuff, you can only get it at the uh, auto body paint supply places. It's not sold in, sold in woodworking. Woodworking stores will only sell you the, the gray, the red, and the white. We also have a green one that's really coarse. But I use the scotch bright pad as a backer for my sandpaper. That way it, it keeps it insulated, keeps the paper cool. It's heat and friction that destroys your sandpaper. And I normally turn the lathe down to somewhere between three and 500 RPMs when I sand so I don't burn the paper. But in the old days, you folded the paper four times so it didn't burn your fingers. And then you've got that sharp corner that'll go into something and dig in. And so I just use a scotch bright pad. It keeps it cool. It also conforms really nice to the curves. And then it's already there for when I'm doing the finish. So basically that stool is done. We'll say it's done. And this is the hard part. This is the one reason I didn't like these. Oh, shoot. You have to do the old fashioned way. I unscrewed the, unscrewed the chuck. There we go. You should unplug the lathe if you do that, just to be safe. And I can't remember if the video shows me marking this, but I got a few minutes, so I will mark it. I'll show you how I mark it if you can get the camera over here. So what I've done is I made some buttons and I put a little dimple in the middle of it because if you try to put your compass in the middle of this hole, it's not gonna stay in the middle. So I put that in there and I've started going in, I used to go in an inch and three quarters, but now I'm going in about two and a half, two and a quarter, two and three quarters. All right, so I guess I'm gonna go in two and a quarter. I don't have a two and a half anymore. Question, Question yeah. Oh, I just turned it between center, turned it between centers like you do anything. And then I put a 10 in in it to fit the hole. 13, 30 seconds, 10 in. <laughs> That's for later. So generally what I do is I look at my blank and decide which is the prettiest, prettiest end grain part. And most of the figures right up there. So that's gonna be the front. So I'm gonna put my little dimple with my pencil that just fell on the floor. Oh, I said, just pull it into the shavings. So I'm going in a two and a quarter on this one and I'll make a mark. And then we're gonna do a little geometry. So I set my compass to that distance. I had to teach a friend of mine how to do this. He does a three-legged platters and I had to teach him how to do his math to do it. So why did the distance change from the, the spacing of the- Oh, I'm bringing the legs in further into the seat so they don't stick out quite so far. Trying to make it so they're less trippy, but still, still stable. Yeah, I used to go in, uh, about inch and three quarters to two inches. Now I'm going in about two and a quarter. And this is a bigger seat. With a 12 inch seat, I would go in smaller. The smaller the seat, the further out to the edge I'd be to get more stability. But with a bigger seat, you already got plenty of spread. So then I start at that point and I make a little dimple there because that's where my first leg is. And then this is the radius. I just walk the radius around on the outside. And you really only need to go around once, but sometimes it's fun just to go back around the other way and just see how accurate you were. And usually what happens is they don't quite match up, so you'll just split the difference. 
but really if you're off 16th to an eighth of an inch, nobody's ever gonna know. Now, the most important thing, and that was the radius. Yeah, it was the radius. Just dividing the circle into six equal parts. And I brought a mallet, so I'm gonna make a dimple right here, big enough for my drill bit. And then I circle it because I'm using ambrosia maple and go to every other one. And I'm going in between the two X marks. But and I don't like pencils these days. They always break, they don't work. But now I guess we can watch the video. <clears throat> I think I do this on the video, but I can't remember. We did the video a while back. All right, so I'm going to show you how I uh, lay out for drilling the holes in my stool seat now that I've turned it. Uh, first thing I've got to do is I've got to put something in this hole for the compass. Uh, without that hole, the compass won't sit straight. And then I, I pick one of these two dimensions. And with this size stool seat, two inches is about right. So I'll go in and I'll make a little, make a little point right there compass and I'll set it to that diameter and that's about it oops and then I'll draw my line around I'll try to make it dark enough for the camera to pick it up and then I divide it into six parts by using the radius and I'll just go around and make little arcs And you can go around back the other way if you want. You don't really have to, because if you're off a little bit, nobody's going to know. It's not like it has to be dead on. And then I take my magic dimpler, my cotton picking thing, and I make a dimple on every other one. I'll make sure, because this is ambrosia maple, to make sure I drill in the right spot, I draw a circle around. I don't want to drill in one of those little holes. And then once I've done that, I need my sight lines. Because that'll determine the splay. So I'll go from the dimple I made to the marks opposite it. Just draw my sight lines. And if the uh, little X's don't line up perfect, just kind of split the difference. Once again, it doesn't have to be dead on. And of course, once you do that, the best use of the skew is to sharpen your pencil. At least that's my favorite use of it. All right, I've got my sight lines. Now we're ready to drill. So this is my table that I've attached to, to the uh, platform on the drill press. It has a piano hinge up front so I can raise and lower it and change the angle. It has these uh, brass cabinet locks, so I can lock it at the right angle. And in order to set that angle, I have these pre-made pre -made, uh, wedges, different angles. Uh, this one, the 24 inch stool is 12 degrees. And for the 17 inch high stool, it's 15 degrees. So I have different wedges. And I just bring the platform up, slide the wedge in it all the way in for sitting flat. Put the other one on the other side. 
kind of want to make sure I push down on it to make sure it's locked tight and then I lock, lock the brackets in. All right, so this is, I've got the angle set. This sight line's important because that sets the splay on the legs. And I want to make sure it lines up with the tip of the drill bit. And that looks perfect. And then I, I have sandpaper here so it won't slip as easily. And then I get the drill bit set in the little dimple I put in. And then I line up my sight line with that line in the middle of the table. And now it's all set. All right, so before I drill the holes, I set my depth stop. I use a quarter inch piece of masonite. That way I don't drill through my seat. And then I put the drill bit in the dimple and then I line up my sight line. And I go slowly so that upper wing when it hits doesn't spin the blank out of my hand. Back out a little bit to make sure it clears. Take your time. Then I go to the next hole. It's a good thing I do those circles so I can find the hole. Line up my sight line. Back out a little bit. Now the holes are done and I'll take this to my palm sander and sand off all my markings. And it'll be ready for the legs. So once I've drilled all the holes and, and, and sanded the back, that's kind of weird that echo, but uh, to put the finish on, I've got a block of wood with a little dowel that has a 13, 30 seconds hole. And then I have a little lazy Susan, so I can just, I'll spray the backside in my hand. And then I'll put this guy on and then I put it on the lazy Susan and I spin it around and spray it. And I give it probably about four coats or more. And then I set them aside and wait till later. So I guess we can take a break right now. If I'm doing a, a bunch of them or even one stool, I'll turn all the legs. I leave the tenon slightly oversized and then I'll lay the legs right next to each other. <clears throat> and as I sand them, I'll take the skinniest one first and I'll get it completely finished. And then I'll do all the rest of them to match the skinniest one so that they all look pretty close to each other. But as I do it, I'm gonna go over and I number each, each leg, and I have a number in the hole, one, two, three, or A, B, C, and I fit the leg to that tenon. Then I put it back in, and once the tenon fits the, the hole, then I sand them. That way I don't have to have my dust collector on all day. And if I'm doing five stools, I'll have 15 legs. Now, normally to find the center, you can use a straight edge and go corner to corner. You can use one of those center finders and you have to go to all four corners because I know the guy that cut these legs and I'm pretty sure they're not perfectly square. But if you got a buddy like I do, Terry Brown made this really nice plexiglass thing for me. It's got a nut welded on, well, glued onto it. And then it has these uh, Allen screws. They probably have another name. And then he has all these different holes for different diameters. And what I do is I'll just try to face the camera. So you just put it on there and you twist it sideways. It locks in and I've got my nail spring loaded because it wasn't spring loaded before. So it was always getting hung up. So with the spring, it pops out and I just give it a whack, flip it over and twist them. And even if it's not square, it'll find pretty close to the center. And the springs really help, help keep that 
point of the nail out of there so it's easier to twist it. And then I'll try not to lose my nail. My legs for the 24 inch tall stools are 25 inches long because they're going up into the stool seat close to an inch. And by the way, I don't, the depth of this hole is probably a little deeper than an inch. I'm not really care. I don't really care that it's a little too deep. Get somewhere for the excess glue to go. And on all my legs, I try to put a little shoulder on there so this bottoms out in the seat. Now the best the best way to hold your chairs and your your seats together is to have a through tenon, a tapered through tenon with a wedge in it. That way, every time you sit on it, you're putting it down on the taper. But I go out of my way to find highly figured wood, and I don't want it interrupted by three dots. So I just go into the seat. And then I look at my blank, and I'm trying to make sure I have nice straight grain. I don't want any run out. Run out is where I want nice straight grain, but if I've got one that's got the grain going out the side, I, I really don't want to use that because that's going to be hitting that end grain straight on and it's really hard to deal with. This is really nice and straight and there's no problems anywhere. Sometimes if there's a little problem on the end, this is going to be the skinny part down here. So I'd put that down there and hopefully it would turn away, but I don't have any of that. So I'll just put it right in. I'm using a Stebbs center, it's spring loaded. And normally I don't bring it all the way up to touching. I should have left it where it was. I forgot this guy was hard to move. I don't want it all the way up touching it because I want to I want to extend it out a little bit. I want to make sure it's extended out at least the width of your thumb so that Morse taper bites in. And you want to make sure you lock it down before you try to tighten it. And notice how I have a finger resting on the bearing center, the revolving center. That helps it. I mean, line up that hole better. If, if, if you hold it back here, it goes all over the place. Even when I'm up here, if I've had too much caffeine, it's really hard to get it in on that hole. And then I grab the hand wheel and I grab my blank. It's, it's wiggling up here, so it's not tight enough. That's pretty good. A little bit more, that's good. You don't want to over tighten it because then it'll tend to do that more. Lock that in. Now at home, I have two banjos and I have a wooden tool rest. So I don't have to move my banjo back and forth. Uh, but here I'm gonna have to do a little bit and then a little bit more. And I put the corners parallel to the floor. That tells me where that most sticky out part is. So I know basically where I want the height of my tool rest. And this is gonna be slightly tapered down here. So I'm not gonna get it parallel to the bed of the lathe. Normally I would, but I'm going to go ahead and cut in my taper as I go. And I'm going to try to be quick. We'll see how fast I can be. And I love my spindle roughing gouge. The beauty of this guy is it's the bottom third of a circle. And then I have a flat that's about a half an inch long. And I can use that flat the same way you use a skew without the worry of a catch. The only difference is this is a 40 degree bevel and the skew has a 25 degree bevel. The skew is much sharper. Uh, and if you're doing Windsor chair legs and you don't want to sand, you need to use the skew. But if you're going to sand using this flat edge or using the skew, there's no difference because the sandpaper is going to make this smooth and it's going to rough up the skew. So if you're going to sand, it really doesn't matter. And most everybody has trouble with the skew. And I really like my roughing gouge. Uh, a spindle roughing, one of these inch and a quarter spindle roughing gouges is the first tool I ever bought. So it's kind of like I'm really used to it. So lay speed, this is two inches in diameter. It's kind of long. So pretty much I can go about 2,200 RPMs plus or minus. If you're a beginner, I'd stop at 1,800. And I forgot to spin it by hand first, should have done that. So right now we're about 1300. I changed the pulley to the high speed pulley while we're on break. Now right now at about 1800, and it feels really nice. It's like a fan up here. So we're going 2100 roughly. 
So I'm gonna have my thumb on top of the handle. Uh, sometimes you can choke up, but right now I need that leverage. You gotta have metal to metal contact with the tool rest. That's number, number one rule, ABC, anchor bevel uh, cut. So I'm gonna put it on the tool rest. I'm gonna drop that handle further than I think. And I'm gonna move it forward to the heel, touches the wood. And then as I lift it up, I'm gonna draw it slightly back. Not as much as I'm doing now, but I'm gonna draw it slightly back so I don't have pressure on the bevel. I don't want pressure on the bevel. I want bevel contact without pressure. And it's looking to me like I didn't get that tool rest at the right height. Normally at home, I don't have to fiddle with the tool rest so much because I'm used to the height of my lathe. This time I remembered to turn it by hand. So we're all set. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna start at this end. I'm gonna get the wood that's in the way out of the way. I have a lot of beginners that try to start back in here and go this way. And you got all that wood in front of you. So you're fighting it and fighting it. So I'm just gonna knock it off, knock it off, knock it off and get it out of the way. It's a whole lot easier that way. I'm gonna have my, my thumb on top of the flute. I'm doing the underhand grip because a flute's designed to take all the shavings away. And if I put my hand on top, all those shavings are gonna hit my hand. And at the end of the day, it's gonna be sore. And, and Alan Batty, every time I did that, came by and whacked me one. And I finally learned not to do it. He even threatened me to take, take me out in the parking lot and practice his martial arts on me. See, I'm still trying to do it. So my body's gonna be parallel to the lathe, and I'm just gonna shift my weight. My left, my right foot. Because you got that gut muscle to push the. Taking the right touch at first. See, he's pushing it with his stomach. Oh, that's why I want to get a few more pounds on me. Uh, Normally, the cameraman's right there, and I get to shower him in shavings. But I guess, I guess Norm knows better. <laughs> What I'm doing now is I'm raising the handle as I come down here, taking a heavier and heavier cut to kind of taper it. And I'm kind of guessing at the taper. Usually the first leg takes me, oh, anywhere from an hour, uh, 40 minutes to an hour. The second leg's like 30 minutes. Third leg's like 25 minutes. And then when I get up around five legs, they're going a lot quicker because I already know my basic dimensions. And I'm getting a wood that's in the way out of the way. I don't want to be too heavy handed in here because it can start whipping on me and then it can come up over the top of my tool. And then we'll be glad that guard is right there. Still got a flat. One other thing I'd like to point out, getting a lot of trouble with this tool if you don't pay attention to this. But when I'm coming back here, my next cut's gonna be right about there. And the next cut's gonna be right about here. And I'm gonna run away from that wall because when I'm sitting on the tool rest, I need to be cutting right in there. And I'm rolling the flute in the direction of cut to use that whole edge. But when I come right in here, if I, came right about here, then it's gonna cut on that back wing right there and it's gonna go Whoop, and run out on me. So what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna run away from that wall and then I won't have to worry about it. And if I'm not careful, you'll see what happens when I run into it. So time to move the tool rest. And at home, this is a lot faster because I don't have to move the tool rest. Well, this is just like my tool rest at home. It likes to fight me. Yeah, but then it won't sit the right height for my countertop. Now I'm getting up to this flat part of my uh, leg. So I'm gonna make sure I'm parallel to the bed of the leg. Don't wanna have a taper anymore. And while I'm at it, I wanna check to make sure it's still tight in case I got aggressive, that step center will pop loose on me.
once I break the corners, I can go both ways. And if I get close to a cylinder, I point the tool in the direction of cut. Get a slightly smoother cut that way. Still have a flat. Still have flats in there. I got a feeling that that blank wasn't square. This is looking a lot skinnier than it should be. All right, now I'll do that last little edge and then we'll get the story scooped out. Still have, yeah, this thing wasn't perfectly square. I still have one flat in there. So either I didn't get it centered just right or my cut cut man didn't cut it square. I'm gonna assume the cut guy didn't cut it square. When I'm at this end, I'm gonna to have to go that way because I have to have bevel contact to have control. So I might as well just go ahead and do it. You always have to cut from large diameter to small. I can't go from down here or uphill. Although with this tool, I can sometimes get away with it, but it's not a pleasant, pleasant motion. Feeling a little smoother up here. I'm thinking in the middle, I might've gotten a little whipping action going on. All right, so. Generally with spindle work, I like to start down here at the tailstock end and work my way, way back up to the headstock because this is where we're getting our power from. If we get really skinny up here, then it's going to start whipping down here. And there's a guy that uh, basically Windsor chair leg is pretty much similar to this, except this part is a little bit further down, but he'll do this cove first because he has trouble with coves. And in my opinion, once you do that cove, everything up here is now wobbling all over the place, making everything else more difficult. But he has problems with the cove and he figures that, you know, he's already got 15 minutes of work in here. And then he blows it here and he's lost time. So he figures it's better to lose the leg before he's got anything in it. And I'm thinking, why don't you just learn how to turn a cove? <laughs> yeah, well, he's good about everything else, but most, most chair makers are not good turners. Turning is the, the least part of their, their skill set. At least every turn, everyone but Alia Bazzari down Pittsburgh. I've never seen anybody turn a chair leg as fast as he. He's the only chair maker I've ever seen that really does a great job of turning. So I'm using a story stick. Now there's a couple ways to do this. The best way is to draw a full scale drawing of what you want to turn. And then at all the transition points, you want to put a little, little tick mark so you know where to mark it. I'm not good at drawing, so I only drew half the profile. And then what, I, what I've done is I've, oh, well, I gotta play, I'm playing to the audience, not the camera. What I've done is I have a little blot line right here where it says E. And I take my E, e calipers, put it to the edge, and then I line it up with where that line is, and that's the diameter. If I had a full scale drawing, I could go right off my drawing. But because I don't, I'm going to have to go off of, off of these tick marks. And then it's C. Once again, that's, that's this little dip right here. That's C is this part right in there, which I hardly ever measure. But so I just go to that tick mark, that little, little line there. But if you had a full scale drawing, it's easier. Uh, I don't see 2D. So what I do is I, 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 I turn my prototype. And then I make 
then I make my story stick. I sometimes waste more wood that way, but I get a better design and better feel for what I'm turning. It just works best for me. But the right way is to, uh, I'm gonna have to put the tool rest in the middle. I'm having a hard time holding this thing straight. I'm not used to not having my extra large tool rest. Oh, that's much easier. And so I put a little, I put a little, uh, you can either use a file or I just go up to the band so I put a little, not, little notch in there. So it's easy for my pencil to catch in that mark. And at the large diameters, I put a dark line and at the thin diameters, I put a light line. It's one way I can keep track of what's going on. Because it can get real confusing. All right, so. And normally I have my calipers right in front of me. And I usually have, I have a table right here and I usually have my prototype sitting right there where I can look at it. And then I have my calipers lined up. Sometimes I let them sit on the bed of the lathe, but they can tend to fall off. So there's a bead on, and in the old days, before I got smart, I used to come down with a straight taper here. But when you put it on the floor, then part of it's touching and part of it's open and it looked ugly. So you'd have to come along and make a mark on there and then saw it all flat and then kind of didn't saw it right. And then you got to sand it. And then I discovered this cool idea of just making a round ball on the end and I don't have to worry about any of that. And it's a nice, a nice touch. It saves a whole lot of time. So I take the A guy and I take my parting tool. And I had the A cow put it up here. And I, I, I use this tape and I, I, I put a letter on it that matches the same spot on the, on the story stick. And the face shield doesn't work if you don't pull it down. And I'm going to put this is a quarter inch wide parting tool. It's a half inch thick. I'm gonna center it or center the line on the center of the blade. And I'm just gonna part down. And I gotta open it up a little bit, but I don't go all the way down to the bottom. Whoops, I went too far. But, what I did is I have a habit of going too far. So I made it my caliper a little bit bigger. So when I went too far, I still have enough there. And then up in here, I think we're using a, yeah, it's a whole lot easier with that table in front of me. Up in here, we use the D caliper and it's not flat. So this is gonna be fun. Wait a sec. I'm gonna put my lines back in. Somebody uh, wobbled a bit. This one I'm gonna turn it off because I still have a flat there and I don't want to bump into the flat. And I'm almost there. Good thing. I would have done it gone too far. And then this bead is at a D. That's the same depth. So what I do is I take my skew, I'm gonna do V cuts. On either side, this is where the bead's gonna be. Who's done the V cut first? And I need a V cut right in here on this light line. And I'm cutting with the very tip of the tool. 
bevel points in direction of cut. So I have to figure out where this handle is. The blade of the tool is perpendicular to the tool rest. So it's straight up and down at 12 o'clock. If it's kicking me off and I'm too far over towards the headstock, I'll bring it in. If it's not meeting in the middle, then I'm too straight on. And I try to take a thin sliver and I try to remember to wear my uh, face shield. So now I'm going to take this diameter down to B. He got buried. All right, now I can go back to my roughing gouge. Whoops. Got to put your center line back in. And that's the center line for the bead. All right, now I can take that wood back. So this is where the cove is going. Right. Go ahead and take it down. And a bead is a half a circle. So that's that right there is the depth. So that's about what I've gone down here. So now what we're going to do is do the bottom part of this leg. Yeah. Uh, uh, he's, he's asking if I use a steady rest. Uh, if I'm getting a lot of uh, vibration here, I would use a steady rest. Part of why I was getting so much is I'm trying to go a little bit faster than I should. You know, I probably should have turned the lay speed up a little bit higher, but I don't want to scare you all. So, but I'm trying to, trying to go faster. Probably don't have to. I think I got plenty of time, but and somebody said you should have metal to metal contact before you touch the wood. You should pay attention to that. So I'm working on my taper right now. This is a whole lot easier with a long tool rest. I'm going to have to do this paper in two sections, which is going to make it a little more difficult. And this is where that bee rolls into a cove, so I might as well cut it in. Do as much work with my roughing gouge as I can. You got to be real careful because it might want to run back on you. Now, structurally speaking, most of the stress in a chair legs in the top third. After that, it doesn't really matter too much, but we do have a stretcher coming in right about there. So we want to keep some volume right there. So I'm going to roll my little half bead down here, do my little ball. So I'm going to, ooh. Normally I would have the cone on here, but luckily it's better to use a cup center if you can, because it grips better. It's not a good idea to set something like that on the leg. Good thing it's mine and not the clubs. Oh, like the folk school, everything's in perfect condition at the folk school. Twice I've taught there and the air conditioning wasn't working. Because nobody changed the filters. It ticks me off. It's maintenance job. No, it's the resident Turner's job. I hate that stuff. 
All right, so now we're back. The reason I use the cone is I can get in nice and tight. I knew there was a reason I wanted the cone. So when I do a bead, I'm gonna do the outside and work my way back. So I'm just gonna knock that outside corner off. The flute's gonna be at about two o'clock. The tool is pointing up in direction of cut. And there are some guys that will just do use their whole the wrist to, to roll a bead and they'll start at the center line and take a light cut and then heavier and heavier and then light, light. I'd much rather do three or four light passes. It's a lot easier for me to shape it. I don't have to get aggressive. I don't have to fight the wood. I got enough. Norm was worried that I don't have the tool rest sticking out far enough, but. I, I'm pretty sure I'm far enough. Now that he mentioned it, I'm gonna see if, I, if he's right. If you ever had it, to get that little warning that something doesn't feel right, stop, take a break, check everything out. It may be right for somebody else, but something's telling you that it's not working right. So don't just go straight ahead. Norm made that suggestion. So I'm double checking and I'm gonna be thinking about it every time I make a cut. Because he saw something that I wasn't paying attention to. And yeah, I got just enough room. But he's right, if I were a beginner, I'd want that tool rest further over. Just for safety sec, I had like 3 sixteenths of an inch excess, which is just barely enough. But I wasn't being aggressive. So, you know, I was taking my time and paying attention, thanks to Norm's quick eye. So now I pretty much know how skinny it's gonna be down here. We're beginning to get a little vibration so I can back it up with my hand. This works almost as good as, oh, one of the design features that I discovered is sometimes I put a little shoulder down in here and make it like cuffs on a pair of pants. You know, I just, when I'm wasting wood away, I get design ideas. It's too late now, there's not enough there. It would look like I, I goofed. But sometimes I, I, I make a little, make it like it's a little foot. And I slow down when I get near that, that little ball I put in there because I don't want to accidentally run into it. Yeah, it's been so long since I've had to do this in two parts. So from here to here is what I'm gonna work on. Get rid of that lump. It's like a snake swallowed its dinner. And once again, notice I'm moving my body. The tool is locked in in that nice triangle of support. And I'm doing my darndest to cover norm, but I'm not very good at aiming. Uh, one of the demos I went to see was uh, Keith Gottschild doing a stool for a couple reasons. I've known him for years, but I was also curious to what he does differently than what I do. He does the holes the same way I do. He does, drills them deeper than they need to be. Doesn't worry about it. but he doesn't use those sight lines to help him get the display just right. So theoretically we're done there. So we have to bring it up here. Oh, I got plenty of time. Don't know why I'm rushing. We may not need to play that other video if I'm quick. So what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna do my, my bead in here. I've got to make more room. So I'm going back to the skew. Now, in my opinion, and I've, I've learned from Stuart Batty and his dad, Alan Batty. Alan insists that you use the skew for a, a lot of stuff. And Stuart being the son that's gotta be different than the dad says, skew is only good for one cut and that's a V cut. So I, I agree with Stuart on that. 
I can do a much better job with my spindle gouge than I can do with the skew. The skew does have a purpose, but right now I'm just going to use the very tip and I'm going to keep it straight up and down at 12 o'clock. This angle is what I got to figure out, and that depends on how what my bevel is. And sometimes when I sharpen these, yeah, this is a good example. The, the bevel on this side shorter than the bevel on this side. So what's going to happen is one wall is going to be a different angle than the other. It really doesn't matter. All I'm doing is trying to get in there to get room for my spindle gouge to go because I can't just go straight in there. Now I could do a V cut with a spindle gouge, but it's not a pretty sight. So I also like to point my finger down the shaft. This is kind of awkward at first, but once you get used to it, I can, if I need the leverage, if I was doing like a null post of six inches in diameter, I'd be back further on the handle, but I'm doing something small, so I choke up. But by pointing my finger down that shaft, I know exactly where that tool is. And if you were gonna ask me a question up here close, I would set the tool down because when you've got a tool in your hand, you talk with your hands and you need to stab yourself or the guy behind you. So whenever I go up to help a student, we always put our tools down so that we don't get hurt. The only time I had a major injury in class, a student asked me a question and talked with his hand and stabbed himself. And he was on aspirin, so he had to go get stitched up. But nobody's gotten hurt otherwise yet. But anyhow, back to it. I'm only cutting with the tip. I see any powder above the tip. I got to straighten the tool out. And if I take thin little cuts, about the thickness of a business card or smaller, I don't have to use any force. And if I feel that bevel getting thrown off, then it means I'm too far over. I need to come in straighter. If I'm not meeting in the bottom, then it means I'm too straight. And that's about the right depth. That was a heavy cut. This guy can go down a little bit deeper while I've got it in my hand. And once again, if you're not gonna pull your face shield down, there's no point in wearing it. Now I know you guys don't really care about me because nobody mentioned pulling your face shield down. So I know how you... So now I'm gonna roll a half bead on this. And sometimes with this shoulder, I like to have it a straight angle. Sometimes I make it round. Uh, I kind of play around with it. This time I'm just gonna make it a little bit round. Once again, I'm just cutting with the very tip or the side of the flute facing the floor or the side of the flute in the direction of cut. Beginning to pick up a little bit of vibration. I'm trying not to have any pressure on the bevel because any pressure I put on the bevel is going to make it vibrate more. Raising the handle to stay in the cut. And I like to do one bead at a time. I don't like doing all right sides and all left sides. And now I'm going to do the cove. And with a cove cut, it's similar to a V cut. I'm going to start in the middle and work my way out. I've seen some guys start at the outside edge and take a light cut and then heavier and heavier, but I'd rather work my way out from the middle and get wider and deeper with every cut. You can't open that flute. It starts, it's kind of the opposite of a bead. When I finish a bead, that bevel is almost perpendicular to the surface. The flute is closed. That's basically where you start a cove. And the cut starts with a cove when the tool's horizontal. But if you have that flute at all open, it might skate on you. And what Nick Cook taught me is to drop the handle about two inches and slice in and get in quick. Now, as you get older, you have these things called graduated lenses. And if you have them set for reading distance, that's right here. So this is out of focus. Don't hunt and peck for this cut. You have to go for it. If you hunt and peck, you end up twisting and then you get or you roll a flute open too quick and the cut has to be at the very, the very, well, oh, cut has to be at the very tip or on that downhill wing. Can't let that upper wing get in there. It's going to buzz back on you. So you take your time with the cove. 
Now this thing's gonna really start flexing, so I wanna make sure I'm fairly done down in there. So I slice in, scoop it out. Slice in, scoop it out. And I wanna leave a little shoulder called a, a little fillet right in here. I wanna leave a little bit of wood right in there because you need a transition for your eye to go from convex to concave. And as I'm doing this, I'm dropping the handle and feeding the cutting edge forward and scooping it out. When I get to the middle, I drop the handle enough so I'm just sitting on the bevel. And a good cove is a half a circle. And a good bead is a half a circle. And that's not a half a circle. My bead is off a little bit. That's better. So I'm going to work on this little bird's beak. Let's get the back of this onion shape done. It's supposed to be a, this is a long bead. There we go, that looks right. So on a Windsor chair, this is called a bird's beak right in there. And you're supposed to get in there and undercut it. And that's where it's really easy to get that wing in there and get a catch. The person who does it the best is Curtis Buchanan. But only a, only a Windsor chair guy knows that it's supposed to be really undercut a lot. So most other people wouldn't notice the difference. It's real hard to undercut in there and then come out and have a nice smooth curve. And in my early days of turning, I used to wrap sandpaper around something that was a little bit smaller than that diameter and just sand it wrap. And so those guys are done. I'm gonna make that fillet look better. So I'm gonna slice it with my gouge. This is a difficult cut because the fatter you get, the harder it is to get out of the way, but your bevel has to be parallel to the bed of the lathe. So you gotta figure out how to get out of the way of the handle. So I touch the heel to figure out where it is and then I cut. And as I come to that bead, I roll that flute closed. If I have the flute open and I hit the bead, I'll get a catch. I'm going to clean that bead up here. And if you have a ridge, don't worry about ridges. Ridges sand out. Oh, yeah, before I go away, the other thing that's nice about a skew, which helps make my stuff different, is I'm going to go in there and clean up that little gap in there, and make it a nice crisp joint. And sometimes when I'm sanding, the sandpaper will, or the sanding dust will get in there and, and kind of clog it up. So sometimes I come back with a skew and clean it out. But that makes all the difference in the world. Then we'll come down in here. I might as well go ahead and get my tenon set. So I've got a 7 8 inch step center. So if I'm lucky, I'll stop in time. It'll be a little bit more heavy handed up here because that's not as much vibration. And this is where you go, uh oh. Well, we don't need that yet. 
Oh, look at that. I did stop in time. Usually I go too far. Getting better. So I'm going to leave it fat. I'm fairly certain it's fat. Yeah, these guys don't quite fit. And then when I get ready to sand all my legs, I'll fit it to the hole. So now I'm going to work on this guy right here. So I got to take that down, make sure. I need to bring my pattern up. Okay, so these are the two low spots. So this one I'm going to take down with my uh, parting tool. And it doesn't have a gauge for it. So we're just going to guess at it. Normally, this guy right up here and this guy right here are the, basically the diameter that I get to. Well, I, I do sometimes measure them, but usually it turns out that it's the full diameter. That's about where that's supposed to be. One of the things that happens when you have a lot of lines on here is you get confused as to what's what. And I think I just got confused. Well, luckily I got confused in the right manner. I didn't mess up. Why the first one takes so long going to do a little V cut because it's another thing like what's going on right in there. If they'd done this V cut first, I wouldn't have gotten confused. Like I said, the first one takes a little bit longer. You know, if I'd been smart, I would have practiced before I got here. But just so you can see what's happening, this is what we're up against. So that line represents that part right there. So I'll take it down smaller. And the party tool gets rid of wood real quick. So I might as well just hog some wood out. I know it's all got to go. And then we'll work on this nice vase shape. As soon as I find my roughing gouge. So I'm going to do a little bit of scooping, pointing the tool in direction of cut. And I'm kind of just scooping it out. And now I'm going to work up here. I usually have a little uh, little half feet up there. I do as much rough shaping as I can with my roughing gouge. Now I'll go back to my spindle gouge and I'll work on this guy. And usually when I do my first leg, that's when I'm working out my uh, order of cuts. So if I were to do a second leg, I'd probably do a slightly different order than what I'm doing now. And I had that, I didn't have the flute closed enough. So we're gonna hope I had extra wood there. Another place where people get catches. Once again, it's another bird scoop. So I'm doing a peeling cut with that flat edge on the roughing gouge. Pardon? A peeling cut. 
like peeling an onion. Peeling, peeling, P-E-E-L-I-N-G, if I spelled it right. So right now I'm locked in with my fingers. This is one of those cuts that I hold tight. Now I can relax. I'm kind of cheating a little bit. I'm kind of scraping with that bottom wing in order to get through that cut. You gotta be real careful. It's real easy to get a catch in there. Some reason I'm picking up vibration up in there, and it shouldn't be. There's a lot of things you can do with this rough and gouge. Oh wow, I'm doing pretty good here. So now I'm gonna do a little half bead up here. I like to have this shoulder right here to bump into the bottom of the seat. Kind of what helps the whole thing register on the seat. And then once again, we're gonna have a, uh, another little cove cut. And good point to tell you is when you first get that spiral, go ahead and get rid of it. Because the second time I put my tool in there, I had it in the right position, but it fell into the spiral and it got pulled sideways. I shouldn't have been rushing because I knew better than to put it in a second time. Because once you get that spiral in there, it's gonna suck that tool in again. So you have to have the flute closed, slice in, and then go with it. Take your time, don't try to rush. And once again, you don't pull your face shield down, it's not gonna protect you. Now I'm trying to keep this area up here about an inch in diameter or a little less. Because this is where all the stress is up in here. So you don't want to get too thin right in there. And I'm not sure why I'm getting vibration in there because this lathe is running smooth. So it's not the lathe. It's probably pressure on the devil and we're getting some, some vibration. And I kind of found it. If I get this part right in here close enough, then I shouldn't mess with it. It's real easy to blow it up. We already have a lot of a lot of time in this leg. Clean up this little hump down here. Yep, picking up vibration. This is where a steady rest will come in handy, but it takes a couple of minutes to set up, uh, takes a couple of minutes to set up a steady rest. So if you can get away with not using one, you're a whole lot better off time-wise. And I have both, the, I have the one-way spindle steady rest and the one-way bowl rest, steady rest. I haven't used the bowl one much. But 
a little hump right in there. Now, any ridges sandpaper will take out, like those ridges right in there, I don't have to worry about. Sandpaper would take them out. And I'm not sure why I'm getting vibration up here. Up close to the headstock, I shouldn't have any. So as I look at this leg, I'm gonna have to sand that vibration out because for some reason it's coming in, but I don't, I don't think it's the bearings. If it was my lathe at home, I would think the bearings were going bad, but this one sounds really quiet. So it's probably operator error. Pardon? Don't grab the hand wheel when it's spinning. I could probably loosen it a little bit. That might help. You know, it'd be nice instead of having this in compression is to have it pulling. And I think, I think I saw online where somebody made a gizmo to put in here and stretch it rather than compress it. And then you wouldn't have this problem. But I'm not gonna worry about it. Sandpaper will take care of it. You know, right there, I'd probably use 100 grit sandpaper, whereas, then I'd probably use it right in here. I got bumps and lumps. I could take my, take my time and get rid of them, but we got 10 minutes left, so we'll see. Now, when I sand the leg, I get rid of the tool rest. And once again, I, I get the scotch bright pad out. And because this is, oh yeah, one of the things that Keith Gottschild mentioned is in columns, they have in, in, in stasis where it's a set curve. You could do that in your stool legs too, rather than have a straight straight line. And there's a mathematical formula to figure out the E N T A S I S or something and stasis. But it's a slight slight curve in it. That way, when you look at a bunch of columns, they look straight. If you make them straight and you look at them, they look screwed up. But what I would do is I take take this flat sponge and use it here and then it knocks out all the high spots. So I don't have to worry about little bumps and lumps. I can just knock out the high spots with the sponge. And then I use the scotch bright pad like this or like this or around like that. And I sand all that junk. And then when I get in that, the nice thing is with this scotch bright pad, I can curl it up and get in there and get the coves nice. It's generally when at the bottom of the cove because the grains like this, you go one way you tear it, go the other way you tear it. So right at the very center, it's not really perfectly smooth. So if you get sandpaper round in there. So anyway, I'd sand that all up. And then rather than run the video again, if you guys don't mind, we don't need to run that video. I'll show how I drill the holes. Because I got, I got 10 minutes and I can do that. It'd be probably better than using the video. So I'm gonna do it on the lathe bed. Have I had a leg fail? Oh yeah, they're at home. Because they're just too or... Or I'm, you know, I get kind of arrogant and start zipping along and forget, or you know, one of them's got some some run out, or maybe it's got something in it that's you know, you know, might have been on the side of a hill and one half of its intention, the other half in compression. And it went all wonky on me. Sometimes it's the wood, but nine out of 10 times it's operator error. Or like, you know, I'm going along, whipping along and I, I take the high spot down as a low spot. So I just throw that leg aside and I'll use it for something else. So when I go to drill these legs, oh, put it out of the way. I made this little jig. And what I decided on the 24 inch legs is that the, the foot rest should be about roughly nine inches from the floor or so, but I always measure from the top. So I made this little jig, it sits on top of the leg. And then I make a little, little mark with a watercolor pencil, a white one right there at the, at that level. And then for the, the back leg, 
I like to have that stretcher, the back stretcher coming in at an angle. So for the back leg, I have it coming down. Looks like I've got it 11 inches from the top. It used to be 12, I've moved it. So I make a little mark and I make it in the, in the face grain where you see that little, little cathedral pattern. I don't do it in the side where it's straight because it'll split. This way it'll be more solid. And then to drill the holes, what I used to do is, I used to use the one-way uh, one drill wizard. But what I do now is I've got my marks and I didn't make the marks, but I take this guy and did I bring my regular drill? No, I was supposed to and I didn't, did I? Yeah, this is the wrong drill. We'll just pretend I have a drill in here. And I, I line up with this hole and I stick it in that little chalk mark I made. And I go in and I spin it and you get a little crescent moon. And if the two tips of the crescent moon aren't parallel to the floor, you twist the leg a little bit. And then you spin it some more. And when those two parts of the crescent moon are like parallel to the floor, then that means you're dead center. And then you drill into the drill bit and kind of hold the drill like this and hold the leg. And it's really nice if you have a partner. There's a picture up there of, of, of us doing a Windsor chair that way, but that's how they did the Windsor chairs. And I said, that's great. And so then the center, the foot rest, I go to the drill press because that's a straight hole. And what I do to figure out how long the stretchers need to be is I made these little jigs and I've got arrows, so that would go in a hole. And that's where I read. And I've got them labeled B. These are B, so they're set to goes together. And you gotta make sure you put the right end in the hole. So I, I stick them in there and then I push it in and then I stretch the legs. I make sure they're all the way in and I stretch them and get it tight. And then, so if I were making a stretcher for this guy, it would be 16 inches. So this would be 16 inches. Yeah, this is just two pieces of wood. And on one of them, I put a little ruler. I'll try to not shake. Oh, there you go. There you go. And if I move it the right way. But I just put a little ruler on there. Whoa. And so I just stick it in one hole and then the other. And then that tells me when I stretch it out. So then we got this guy done. And these things were tight when I first made them eight years ago. This thing's been on the road with me a lot. And it's totally loose. So don't anybody try to sit on it. So to drill the hole in the back leg, once again, I got my mark, I got my tick mark. And then I line up with this guy and make sure you do. And then I go down like this and I kind of hold my hand. This is nice because I have that little uh, V groove. And then once again, I buzz it and I make sure the two peaks of the crescent moon are even. If they're not, I twist the leg, buzz it again, and then I drill to the tape. And I'll be holding it, holding it with one hand and drilling with the other. And then, because everybody does it straight across, and oh, okay. David Scott in the mountains did it at an angle, and I said that looks pretty cool. So I did it at an angle, and I always have to mention his name when somebody asks me why it's at an angle, because I saw David Scott's and it looked nice. And I told him that I was doing it, and I said I mentioned your name. And he says, as long as you mention my name, I'll be happy. But then a, one of my students saw in an antique, an antique book, you know, a stool with it at an angle. And what it does is if you just have them straight across, it's kind of, it's static. By putting it at an angle, it gives it, gives it more, a side view. makes it more dynamic or 
Whatever those are, I'm not good at the art words. Now you don't have to make it level. You don't have to. Three legs are automatically level. No, you don't have to make the character level with the. No, I'm having it at an I, I like to have it at an angle. But the idea is you get these things. You, you, oh, yeah, to figure, oh, we didn't measure it. Maybe that's what you're talking about. Forgot to measure it. So once again, I'll use these guys. And I got an arrow to make sure I put the right side in. It says read on it, and it's got an arrow. So I put it in there. And then I put this side in. Got to make sure you do it the right side. Yep, that side goes in. And then once again, I stretch it. I kind of get it fairly tight. So this looks like it's going to be 13 and an eighth. So then I, then I cut this guy to 13 and an eighth, and then I turn them. And then when I put it together, we got four minutes. I glue it. I glue the centerpiece together first, and I try to get the face grain going straight up. And I try to figure out. There's usually a pretty side and an ugly side. And I try to have a pretty side face in the seat, but invariably I get it backwards. And I try to have the pretty side facing up so you see a pretty side. But, so I, you know, I, I put glue on all the tenons and glue in all the holes and I have them all laid out and they all go in their numbered hole like one, two, three. And so what I do is I, I, I get this whole carriage glued together. And normally the tenons are pretty darn tight. You don't want them super tight, but you don't want them like that. Yeah. Oh yeah, that's got a notch. It's got. Oh yeah, I see what you're talking about. Yeah. Yeah. No. Uh, if I get my tenon right, I don't need to do this. This tenon was loose. So I went to the bandsaw with the face grain sticking straight up and I cut a notch in it and then I'll put a wedge in it. And what I do is I, I put the wedge in and then I test fit it, drive it in a little bit more, test fit it. And when it's feeling like it's gripping, then I'll take my Japanese saw and saw it with it sticking out about a quarter of an inch. So that when I drive it in, hopefully it'll hit home and it'll drive it in and lock it in. But I only put it on the tenons that don't fit because this is a whole extra step. And it has 10 minutes to put in the stool together because I gotta, gotta make a wedge. I gotta get the right size wedge. It makes a lot more work. But I'm glad you asked that. That's what you have to do when things don't go right. And I'm gonna try. Well, right now I have glue already in the seat. And these this middle part's already been glued together. Yeah. I'm trying to be nice if these tenons weren't so weak. I might need a third person because it's going to fall apart again. And then we pick it up and you got to kind of, don't put it all the way in the holes yet. You just get it in there. That's why I need a third person. Yeah. All right, so, and now what I do is it's in and I take my little rubber mallet, tap, just like doing a car car tire, you don't want to drive one all the way in. You want to kind of drive them in evenly, because if you get one all the way in and you've got a lot of tension and compression in here, sometimes you can't get the other ones in. But this one's loose enough. I'll go around. You want to use? Don't use the black one of these, because the black one leaves black marks. But I knock knock them all in, beat them all up. And I was going to show you how to do a button, but I forgot about that. We don't have time for the button. But I usually, uh, $350 because they go in a gallery. I only get 175 if it's in a gallery, and that's not enough. It usually takes about five, five to six hours to put them together. So I put a piece like this or matching wood to the legs in a chuck. And then I turn a little button. Quit shaking. And I turn a little button, just like doing a cap on an ornament. And you know, if I've got a big stick like this, I'll turn a bunch of buttons. So next time I don't have to do them. 
And then I try to make that tenon the same size as the hole, which it's not, and it goes in the hole. In the old days, they used to just put a dowel plug in the hole, but I, I thought the button looked much more finished. And I thought about putting a long finial on my button because I'm known for finials, and then I realized somebody's little baby's gonna crawl underneath there and put their eye out. And I said, no, don't get too fancy. So that's it. Any other questions? Uh, I usually use tight bond original whenever I can, but I also like uh, using uh, high glue because high glue, you can heat it up and take it apart. And also if you get your tenons real tight, high glue is like a lubricant and then it'll, it'll, excuse me, it'll slide together a lot easier. So high glue is pretty nice, but it has a short shelf life. And I use the brown glue, high glue. Brown, I think. Yeah, old brown glue, yeah, I use that one. I don't use the type on high glue. I use the, and I get that at Woodcraft or Clingspore. And it has a date on it. Because after a year, it's worthless. And if you make it, so if you buy the little, little balls and stuff and heat it yourself you got to use that stuff within a couple of weeks or it goes bad but i use high glue in my windsor chairs so anyway that's it you gotta clean up.